with the right hand, puts her down. He's going to dump him hard to the ice. Brady Leopold just loves to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Warrior. My dream of being a professional hockey player became a reality, but it was all taken away from me in a very short period of time. For many years, hockey was my outlet. Hockey was my drug. When I had a stick in my hand, nothing else mattered. I was able to break into the Western Hockey League in 2004, and I even won the Swift Current Broncos number Broncos rookie, rookie of the year. The year. During the summer, During of, my the summer year, of my rookie I year, experimented I experimented with drugs for the first time. The first time. After just seven, after games, just seven games in my sophomore season, season walked, during the summer of my rookie year, year Bronco, I experimented with drugs. drugs nobody knew I'd been nobody sexually, knew I'd been sexually abused. abused. Seven games, seven games and everything, and everything, everything to hide it from everybody, but I just, but I just couldn't take it. Drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol. I did return. I did return to the Broncos in 2019. Things were never the same. I was eventually yeah, traded, was eventually to, the traded to the Cologne Rockets in my final year of junior, where I got, junior, to, where I got to play on a line with the Dallas, Dallas Stars captain, Jamie Benn, Jamie ben, and, ben, and one of my best friends, the extremely talented Colin Long. Colin Long. It was by far, was my, by best far my best ever. season ever, and I even signed, and I even Tampa signed with the Tampa Bay Lightning's organization. A dream come true, a dream right? Come true, right? That's when everything, That's when went, everything wrong. went wrong. First it was the cocaine. First it was the cocaine. Then came the oxycotton. Then came the oxycotton. And that led me into, and that a, led 12 me into a 12 year journey into the deepest, into pits, the of deepest pits of hell. Within two years, within two years, I had now made the switch. I had now made the switch to heroin, to heroin, fentanyl, fentanyl, and everything in between. And, everything in between. and I was now an and I was now an intravenous drug user. Multiple suicide, Multiple attempts, suicide attempts and over five trips, over five to, the trips to the psych ward. I was a shadow, I was a of, shadow of who I once was. By 2014, By 2014 I was homeless on Hastings and Vancouver, Vancouver street the worst street in North America. By 2015, By 2015 I was a wanted, I was a wanted criminal, making the Crime, making Stopper, the crime headlines Stopper headlines more than once. More than once. After spending three, After years, spending in jail, three years in jail, I had completely, I had completely given, up. given up. With nowhere to turn, with nowhere to turn, nowhere to go, and nowhere to go, I finally started, I to, finally get started to get honest. I took a chance. I took a chance and made, and made some major changes. This is my story. This is my story. I overdosed over, I overdosed 10, over times. ten times. I'm one of the lucky I'm one of the lucky ones. ones. And for that, and for that, I always I will grateful. always be grateful. This is for all the this men is for and women all the men and women we've lost. Matthew Lazinski, Matthew Lazinski, Mitch, Mitch Fadden, this one's for you. This one's for you. My name's Brady. My Lee name's Brady Lee. And I've been to hell and, and back. I've been to hell and back. This, this, road to recovery. This is the road to recovery. I'm grateful. Oh yeah, I'm grateful. Oh yeah, I'm stable. What's going on, guys? Welcome. Hockey to hell and back, episode number sixty. I have no idea why that was echoing for a couple of minutes, but that's uh, that's what happens when you do it live. New things happen all the time. Thanks for being with us. Today is uh, going to be a fun episode. We talk about a lot of hard hitting things on this show: addiction, mental health, people who have passed away, which I'm going to get to in a minute, as I always do on this show. Uh, but tonight, I hope that we can have some fun, and we never really know where these shows are going to go. I'm going to try to get through this episode without a hat on i've only done one ever and i'm like ah, maybe we'll get the flow going tonight but thank you for being with us if you're watching live if you're listening after on apple Podcasts, google spotify all those places thank you please tell your friends about it if you like it i don't pay for marketing or anything like that i rely on all of you guys and i've relied on you guys for so much over this last 17 months that's right the other day was 17 months clean off of all of that garbage so thank you so so, so, so much. I never thought it was possible. And before we go any further, I want to encourage anyone out there that's struggling with mental illness, but especially addiction, because what I've seen is when you're struggling with addiction, mental illness is always there. It's not always this case with mental illness. You're going to be an addict, but every single addict that I've ever met has an underlying mental illness. So I just want to encourage everyone not to give up on yourselves it's a hard thing. There's no easy way to do it. You know, everyone's story is different, but there is always hope. If you're willing to do the work and get honest, seriously, anything is possible. You know, now I'm partnered with True Hockey, which I would have never imagined two years ago sitting in a jail cell 
you know, I want to give a special shout out to them for believing me. I'm rollerblading across Canada, May 28th, 2022. We start in Newfoundland, starting with Terry Ryan out there uh, in Mount Pearl. I'm really looking forward to, to meeting him in person. We've become great friends over this last year and recently was just on his podcast, uh, Tales with TR. And for anybody that wants to dive into a little bit more about my stories, things that you've never heard about me, for whatever reason, you know, I... I told TR a lot on that episode and I'm grateful that he had me on so a uh, shout out to him out there in Newfoundland but yeah there's still many stories I haven't shared I am writing a book and um, you know it's it's one thing at a time here I got a lot of stuff on the go but you know today like I said 17 months clean so thank you to everyone for your ongoing support if it was from the beginning or if you're a new listener or viewer uh you know supporter of puck support seriously thank you from the bottom of my heart because without you guys rallying behind me there's no way this ever happens absolutely not without the game of hockey without the hockey community plain and simple i'm probably in jail right now or dead and that's the reality and you know that's the way that my life was and i had given up 10 plus years of addiction and overdoses and it feels really good to be sitting where I'm sitting today. I still have a long ways to go, but I just wanted to tell you guys, thank you. I know I say it all the time, but 17 months, I couldn't even go 17 seconds before without, I hate to say it candidly, putting a needle in my arm. That's where I was at guys. I was trying to die. And so if you're struggling, don't give up on yourselves. If you need help, there's no shame in asking for help. You know, a big thing, what I do here through the podcast, through my daily life is you know, honoring those that we've lost. You can see them behind me. I add a new one every single podcast. Some aren't even in view right now. Tragically, there's even more to be put on the wall. And I just add one every podcast. The individuals in this photograph have all either died, you know, of suicide or addiction related causes. And, you know, this is a problem, not just in hockey, but what I know is addiction, mental illness and hockey. And you know, I should be in that picture. There's no two ways about it. And every day I wake up and I just feel so lucky that I'm that, you know, that I'm still here and I feel called upon to do something about it. So if you want to learn more about Puck Support, go to PuckSupport.com. We have tons of apparel and different things and every single item will have an in memory of one of those that we've lost. I think Steve Montador is in both my hats. <laughs> go figure. But in the shirt, guys. It's here, Quentin Van Horlick, my old coach from the East Coast Hockey League. That's what we do. We honor those that we've lost in every single episode. We honor one of those individuals. Tonight is no different. Tonight we're remembering Chad Miller. And I actually had his mom, Erin, on my podcast about a year ago. And she started the Miller Strong 17 Foundation in Chad's name. Well, he was away playing at Robert Morris University in the state of Illinois after being prescribed Vicodin and different painkillers, he turned to street drugs when they were taken away. And uh, unfortunately, during the season, he actually passed away of a heroin overdose. And this was a young man, a 21-year-old man playing at Robert Morris University after playing junior down there as well. And, you know, these things happen. And, you know, the hockey community as a whole, we don't really like to talk about this kind of stuff. It's, you know, it's kept hush hush, but I'm doing everything in my power to remember these individuals and to also just show people that there's a way out. These stories are real. Condolences once again to my friend Aaron, his mom down there in Portage La Prairie. That's where he's originally from. He passed away in 2014 at the young age of 21. So tonight we remember Chad Miller. He's up here behind me. So thinking of you, Chad, and all the Miller family, check out Miller Strong 17 on Instagram. Anyways, guys, I'm going to do one sponsor, and we'll get right in the episode. Hi there, it's Regan Bartell, the play-by-play -play voice of the Kelowna Rockets, Brady Leobold's biggest fan. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being a part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. TeamIssued.ca. Promo code TOEDRAG15 for 15% off. You know, I hear that all the time and it never gets old. I was watching an old game from my Kelowna days last night and Regan is, is just amazing at calling hockey and, and an even better person. In that video, there is the owner of Team Issue, Jesse Paradise, who is my teammate 
when I played for the Corner Rockets. He was just 16 years old, but I I could be in that video because I also own every single thing in that war in that uh, video. So maybe we could recreate together. Jess, thanks for your support. He was my second guest when I took a chance and started this podcast over a year ago. So Jesse, I'll never forget that. Thank you. Check out Team Issued, guys. And use promo code TOEDRAG15. That was the only move that I had was a toe drag. So that's why the promo code is TOEDRAG15. Anyways, guys, you know how this goes. We'll see you in about two minutes. Well, tonight's going to be a lot of fun. I have my former general manager from the Norfolk Admirals when I was there for a brief time. Unfortunately, my time with the Tampa Bay Lightnings organization didn't go like anyone wanted. I was not in good shape, I was not in a good mental headspace, and I was severely addicted. It's something that I'm still disappointed about myself to this day, but where I'm at now, I really have no regrets. Tonight's interview is with Mike Butters, or as we knew him as, Buttsy. Mike Butters is a very interesting guy and also a former professional hockey player. Originally from St. Boniface, Manitoba, Mike Butters played his junior in the SJHL, suiting up with the Estevan Bruins for three seasons. Following his junior career, he moved on to the University of Manitoba for one year, and the following season he would turn pro. And from 1990 to 1996, he played in various pro leagues, including the ECHL, the IHL, and most notably the American Hockey League. But Mike Butters isn't just a hockey guy. He's most widely recognized for his roles in the film industry. He was in three of the Saw movies and has been in countless films and even more commercials. His first hit on IMDb is way back in 1990. But aside from acting, he's always had a hand in hockey. He's been the president, the general manager, the assistant coach, and head coach of various programs ranging throughout minor hockey, junior, and of course, professional. He was also a longtime scout for the Tampa Bay Lightning. For the past five years, aside from his jobs in the movie industry, he's been the head coach for the Seattle Snow King Junior Thunderbirds under 16 AAA team. He's a guy that has stories for days, is extremely funny, and I'm really excited to talk to him. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you guys to my former general manager, currently on the road in Minnesota, coming at us from the Marriott Hotel, Mike Butters. <laughs> Nope. Wow. No pressure there, Lee. No pressure. Be funny. Wow. Great to be on the show, bud. Hey, man. Thanks for doing this. Last minute, and I, I really appreciate you being here, man. And, uh, you know, you I called on you just earlier today, and, and you were like, no problem. I'm flying in. I'm at the Marriott. So thank you so much. I, you know, it's sometimes hard to, to line up guests ahead of time. So the fact that you were able to just jump right in. I apologize that it was last minute, but we've been talking over the course of the last couple of weeks trying to make it happen, and I'm just so happy that you're here, man. No, it's all good. I'm, I'm usually the last minute guy. You know, I'm not a big name guy. So when uh, yeah, I saw you had Landsberg on the show, and I, I used to do his show, but I was a last minute guy. If somebody canceled, they're like, ah, get butter, so hop in a cab. He'll be right down here, you know, for some <laughs> ha-ha. And so I'm used to it, and I'm honored, and I'm humbled that you thought of me, and, and just happy to see you. Happy to see you on the other side of the mic, brother. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, man. It was it was ugly, and it was starting to get ugly when I, you know, originally when I met you, I guess, over in Victoria at the Prospects camp, I think, you know, that you were there, correct? Yeah. Yeah, you were there. And and so, like, that to me is, like, you know, after the, the, the time I had in Kelowna, which was great, and, you know, I was playing really well, and I went home, and I, I became severely addicted to cocaine, and... Um, you know, as you know, the story, like, uh, you know, there's a sports net story. I talked about it before, I think with Al May and, and several times on the show with, you know, former teammate mine, Mitch Fadden, who, you know, and, you know, we were partying kind of on our own that night. And the next day we played with Stamkos, who just won his second Stanley Cup. And, you know, I was in a world of hurt, uh, not just physically, but emotionally. And, uh, you know, I was super disappointed in myself in my you know, turnout in Victoria. I, I knew I was strides behind of where I wanted to be, especially. And then, you know, I just couldn't get it together prior to, you know, coming to Norfolk and something that's always kind of weighed on me heavily, but not so much these days, because obviously, like you said, I'm doing so much better, but um, you know, what have you been up to since those days? I mean, I kind of know, but seems like you got your hands in a lot of different things, hockey, the film industry, all that kind of stuff. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, you know, they, I think the going thing, the way the economy is, the way the world is now, everyone needs a side hustle. 
And so a few people told me that. They said, hey, Butts, you got to have a side hustle. So I always had a side hustle. You know, when I was playing hockey, when I was playing pro. I used to do commercials. They'd, who wants to do a, a gym ad for 50 bucks? And like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll learn, you know. So I always had something on the side. And, and that kind of transpired when I was playing, when I finished pro, I, I started doing commercials and then that's how I got in the acting world, right? Well, then my side hustle was hockey then when I was in acting. And then I got back in with the, you know, when I was working for the lighting. Well, since then, so I had a, a really bad concussion. So a lot of the stuff, even though it's not addiction related, yeah. um, a lot of the mental stuff uh, went through some pretty deep, dark times and, and you know, um, I, I don't know if you're going there today, but uh, not not to bring a downer on it, but before I go much further, you know, we lost someone that you may have known. Well, I knew him real well, and Tommy Curvers this week, and and yeah. uh, he was one of those guys that uh, he was he was he was a you, you talked to him for five minutes, you swear you met him your whole life, and he's one of your buddies, and he really cared about the game, loved the game. Uh, we've had conversations about you. Uh, while you were playing and then after you were playing. And, and he's one of those guys that really, uh, I'm going to miss him. He's just a great guy. But but uh, so I've been coaching 16U. I, uh, I've got a mentoring business. I mentor young uh, players anywhere from Bantams to Midgets to Juniors, try to help them get on the right path, try to make sure they're working out right, they're eating right. That company's called Hockey Horizons. i got a few guys that, uh, that help me out with that. I, uh, I run Global Sports. Now, growing up in BC, I don't know if you ever went to Global when you were growing sure up. Did, did man. I sure did, man. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, so I, I've been doing that for just today. This year is my 27th year. So uh, wow. I started Yeah, I started picking up jerseys when I was a player, and now I run all the U.S. camps. So I do that in the summer, and then uh, I'm coaching kids. I'm coaching Team Northwest, a bunch of 16-year-olds from Minnesota, Colorado, all over the West Coast. The great news is, Leaves, I don't have to scout them. I don't. I don't have to pick them. I just have to coach them. There's no pressure this time. I just got to go coach them. That's awesome. How do you? My question is like, how do you have time to do all this stuff? Do you do you do this? Like, are you your own secretary or do you have an assistant behind you? Because this seems like no. I. That's crazy, man. There's no way I could keep all that together. But that's that's impressive. And I think you know what I hear there. The most important thing to me is is being that mentor, right? Like you've gone through it yourself through, through junior, through pro hockey. Plus you have all of this other vast knowledge through like the real world and the movie industry, which I actually hear is quite a bit like hockey in some ways from several people like Terry Ryan being one of them. He's been on letter Kenny and he's actually got an exciting new announcement coming down that I can't talk about, but you know, he, he swears by it. And just, you know, I just was on his show and he's like, man, I'm coming up, I'm coming up to Ontario. You know, I'm going to be there for like two, three months. You got to come to the set, man. You got to come check it out, like, and just see what it's all about. And, and I'm actually excited not to say I'm ever going to get into acting, but I've actually thought about it. I don't think I could like, act but i could be an extra or something i think it'd be fun so you know it, we'll get to that in a second but man actually well you can actually answer that now is it kind of close to hockey there's a lot of similarities you know when 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 i first got started i was i was playing pro roller hockey in anaheim and uh chris McSorley was our coach marty's brother you know and was it we had a uh, was it the bullfrogs yeah yeah. See, I was at me, my dad and my sister and I season tickets to the Vancouver Voodoo every single year they were there. I grew up on that. That's amazing. I didn't know that. That's really that's really cool. Sorry, keep going. Yeah. Oh, no problem. So I was playing for the Bullfrogs and I, I uh, they had a uh, they paraded. They were shooting the Mighty Ducks movie uh -huh. and uh, they paraded all the actors through the locker room and we met them. And then they had a session where we went rollerblading with them. And they, they needed extras. They needed guys to play the kids that could skate. And so a bunch of us went out and did that. They put masks on us so we looked young and, and all that. And so we did that. And, and I kind of got hooked. I mean, I, I, was, I didn't know I was going to be an actor. But when I was a kid, my dad had an 8-millimeter camera. And I used to use the snot out of that thing. I'd take pictures. I'd take home movies and always be walking around with the camera. There's a show like that now uh, where the guy uh, – had all his childhood memories on camera on ABC. I can't remember the name of the show. You know the one I'm talking about? No, I, I don't watch a whole lot of TV these days. But Okay, neither do I, but I, I, I get it on uh, Rerun or whatever. But anyway, yeah. so I I, uh, I got the bug. And I'm like, okay, this is really cool. And and while I was playing for Anaheim, they did high. So my in was through hockey. They were shooting. Gretzky just got traded to L.A. 
there was a whole buzz about hockey. So everyone wanted, instead of a baseball commercial, let's do a hockey. It looks cool. It's hip. It's, you know, whatever. And so they needed guys. And there were a few guys that lived around, you know, the area and stuff like that. But when you, you played pro, like my first audition I went to, actually, uh, Terry Yake, Stu Grimston, yeah. Yeah. brought the audition. It was an ocean spray commercial. I got and Stu's got, behind me, actually. That's what I was looking okay, for. Cool. Yeah, so that they were at the first audition, and I ended up getting the uh, getting the the deal. But a movie set is like a team. It's like you get together in the locker room for the first time, and everyone's kind of looking around. Uh, you know what? I, you all know what to do, and everyone knows they have a job on the team. No one really talks about it, but you all kind of look around to figure out who does what, right? And and everyone just kind of pulls the same rope, and that you and you you hear about temperamental stars and stuff. It does happen, but for the most part, like. The high level guys, the super big stars, the most awesome dudes you're ever going to meet on girls, right? Um, and the bottom guys, the character guys, just the meat and potatoes guys like me, they're all great guys. They just give you the shirt off their back, help you. It's those mid level guys that just haven't got that that big star. They're just dicks, and 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 all of them are. I don't know why they're just bitter. They haven't got that big movie, but. It's still it's still kind of funny working with me to stay out of their way and they're fine, but it, it is very similar. Like as far as the you're you're at work, people don't realize this. I mean, most jobs you're at work at six in the morning, and it's usually it's a minimum twelve hour day, but it's usually about sixteen, twelve, fourteen hour days. Not every day when you're working. So it you know there's an old saying that uh, they pay you the way the acting's free. They just pay you the way around until you got to walk and say your lines. You know. But it's it, it's a good living and, and I love it and and it's 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 helped me out it's helped me raise my kids and, and I'm appreciative. Well, it's it's pretty amazing, man. And you know, I'll just jump right into it while we're on this. We'll bring it back to hockey in a sec. But since we're talking about the movie and stuff, so you, you your most notable notable roles, I guess, would probably be in the Saw movie from at least my research. And and that you've been in several of them. And um, <laughs> and like I got pictures of you in the in the Saw <laughs> movies and. Um, it's, it's pretty cool, man. And like, I'm a huge, uh, saw fan, but tell us a little bit about how that came about, because I know it, it, that really started from hockey too, with Oren Kulis at, at, you know, playing for the, the pickup team or is, am I correct on that? Yeah. You, yeah, man, you did your homework. You're like, uh, Christopher Watkins. Christopher Watkins. No, this was a different team. Uh, I, the team I played, uh, the team I put together was called the Christopher Watkins. But okay. yeah, you did your homework. So when I when I got when I got there, I, I had an injury at the end of my career. I broke my back in a preseason game against Ottawa, and I did not want to be near a rink. I was bitter. I couldn't play anymore, and you know, you know the whole thing, right? So my agent calls me and he says, "I I want you to think about this. Just think about it. Play hockey with some guys. They're like actors and stuff, and and." It might help your career, and I'm like, all right, well, I'll give it a go. And and um, so I played with on this team called the Hawks, the Hollywood Hawks. Bunch of actors. We don't have to get into who. Maybe it'll come up. And in the second <laughs> or third year, you tell us who if you want, man. It's up to you. Oh, okay, all right, uh, cool. I don't know what boundaries we have here. So uh, you know, guys, like okay, well, David E. Kelly, the guy that wrote Chicago, he's a hockey guy, right? His, his brother is uh, uh, the. Uh, well, yeah, I think he's with the Kraken now, but he was with the Blackhawks for years as a uh, player personnel guy. But uh, he's on the team. Dave Coulier from Full House was on the team. Sean right. O'Byrne, the guy that wrote Mystery Alaska. Like, so, no you ever seen so you know Mystery Alaska? Yeah, and I tell that story just to cut you off quickly so I can tell you, but people always ask me, like, how did you get clean this time? Like, what happened and stuff? And so my girlfriend, I was living with her parents at the time, and they live on a lake up here in Muskoka, Ontario, and I literally skated down the driveway right onto the lake. Like, it was like my version of Mystery Alaska. It was like, that is one of my all-time favorite hockey movies ever, but sorry, go ahead. No, like, I, no, no, I mean, that's funny. I mean, so that was written by a guy named Sean O'Byrne, who was uh, at times my defense partner on that team. Uh, <laughs> he wrote the script. Dave Kelly punched it up. But the story, even though it was set in Alaska, was written about our men's league team. And we had a bunch of really good players like, you know, ex-college guys, ex-Brian uh, Bird, an old L.A. King from from the 20s. I'm kidding. Uh, he uh, he was on the team. But we, we had this really cool group of guys that were – it was like – I just thought, you know, they call it beer league. You just go play and you go home. We used to hang out and we'd have social events. We'd have dinners together and stuff like this. And and it, we're, it was a true team, right? So anyways, playing with these guys and this one guy comes in and in, in, I think the third year of the team. 
and he's got hair down to his ass, cowboy boots and stuff. And I'm like, you, you, you lost son? You lost or something? And he goes, oh, my friend asked me to play on the team. Well, that was Oren Coolis. And uh, we got to be buddies. And and um, and he, you know, we wanted to get in the hockey. His goal was to own an NHL team. Anyways, I, I had an agent. I never had a manager, never needed one, but I had an agent. He goes, oh, I'm going to be your manager. So he says, here's the quickest. I'll, I'll give you the quickest, quick as I can story. I'm sitting in my, I'm sitting in my apartment one day. And he says, are you there? Are you, are you in your apartment? I said, yeah. He goes, I'm going to send you something. Well, there was an eight mil. He sends me a, a DVD. And it's the original saw where uh, the, the bear trap scene, you know, when the, the head gets. Okay. So the guy that plays the main guy in Saw, Lee Winnell, was the, the bear trap guy in, in this short film. It was eight, eight, 15 minutes long. He goes, uh, there's going to be a courier coming to your door. I want you to watch this. Uh, call me back. So this courier comes in my door. And he goes, okay, I'm hanging up. I watched this DVD, and it's the Bear Trap team from Saw. It was shot on Super 16. Like, it was an independent student project sent in to these guys to get money. So I said, uh, hey, dude, I watched it. It is some of the creepiest, twisted stuff I've seen. And he says, uh, he says, and I, I said, I don't, you know me, I don't like horror films. There he is. I, I don't like horror films. He goes, yeah, well, I bought it. I go, what? He goes, I bought the rights. I bought the rights, and, he, and you're going to be in it. I bought it, and you're going to be in it. I'm like, okay, great, you know. So flash forward, they actually put it together, throws me a script. And the original, the original idea was I was going to play Jigsaw. And I read the script and I'm like, I mean, I'm sorry, guys, it's 15 years old. I'm going to ruin it, okay? He's lying there all, you know, he's lying there, the whole script. And he just, he doesn't have a lot to do. I go, dude, I've spent my whole life with lines. I'm not an extra, you know, like I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to do it. So I, um, he says, oh, well, you got to be in. I go, okay, well, I want to play the cop opposite Danny Glover. He goes, uh, they already got a guy that they have to have. I'm like, okay, then forget it. And then he, so he says, well, look, uh, I said, I'll do, make a deal. You put, do a cameo in it, and I'll do it. And that's how it came together. So I did the first one, and, of course, get killed off, right? And um, thanks to Jack Nicholson, thank you, uh, Batman, the, the contract is when you do a franchise, you get paid for the next five, regardless. So a bunch of us got killed in the first one. The second one had nothing to do with the first one storyline wise. Like Jigsaw was in it, and one other one other cat. Um, actually, it was Shawnee Smith. Yeah, she was the only other one in it. Mike Mark Wahlberg was in it. And then the fa the fans of the movie, they got really um, uh, not upset, but you know they wrote in like we we loved the story, the original one. So they brought us all back and. There was a time they were talking about doing a, a retro where um, where I was going to, they were going to go back in time. And the reason that Jigsaw did his thing was because I impregnated his wife and like, and all this, it was just, they got a little campy, right? But I was going to be the original killer and it never happened, but it's just one of those things. But yeah, it's I, like, I'm thankful for that. It's an, I, I, I'm not a horror fan, but I love those movies because they are sick and twisted. They are really are. They make you think. Yeah, well, and then you developed a, a relationship with Oren Kulis. As you mentioned, you wanted to own an NHL team, and you know we could talk about that. It, it doesn't matter. It didn't end the way that they had hoped, but at one time, he was the owner of the Tampa Bay Lightning, and that's how I met Oren, and I met his son, Miles. And, um, you know, Oren, obviously, too, he's, you know, one of the, I believe, producers of Two and a Half Men, which was one of the most successful shows, I think, of all time, right? He was a producer? Mm -hmm. or yeah. Pretty yeah. cool stuff. Are you, do you still talk to Oren at all? I don't know. I haven't talked to him. We just kind of lost track when I went back to yeah. uh, after that car accident and he was out of Tampa. We just kind of drifted apart and, and yeah. uh, haven't spoken to him, but uh, I'm sure he's doing well. Yeah, I'm sure he, I'm sure he is too. Um, but it's pretty cool, man. It, that opened. Did, do you think that role opened some doors for you? Um, or, you know, is it just kind of progressed naturally? Like, do people notice you for that? Because I saw, you know, there's a picture here that I have somewhere where, you know, someone. You signed the picture of you in in the Saw movie. It's you know like, yeah, that's uh, that's five, and and isn't that a great wig? That's a pretty cool wig, right? <laughs> that's that's all fake. Yeah, so in the first one, this is how long they did the movies, right? Like I, I had I had hair in the first one, and uh, by the time they did the fifth one, of course, I've got the egg going, and <laughs> we shot it in Toronto. And this guy says I got to do a, like a makeup fitting and stuff. So he goes, "Do you mind if I put the hair on and see what it looks like?" And so actually, that looks all scrapped up. But when he put it on, I was like, hey, "Like I haven't had hair since high school years." So he puts it on. I'm like, "Hey, this is pretty good." I go, hey, "Can I like leave it on?" 
And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, it's easier for me to leave it on and just fix it every day. So I walked around for like, you know, a month and a half when I was filming <laughs> with this awesome head of hair. And I was talking to buddies, and I'm like, why are you always video chatting? I'm like, dude, you notice anything different, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, that, no, it actually believes no. That was not really. That was kind of second coming for me. That the saw it, like when I first got going in the nineties, where I got where I got going was in commercials. Like okay. I, I like I did um, my first job was a national TV commercial for Ocean Spray, and I was the dude you know drinking the drink, and you know someone sees that, then it goes on to like I did a Home Depot where I was the guy craft all beat. Like I've done over a hundred. A hundred nationals, hundred national commercials. Wow! Three, four, like three, four hundred total, almost four hundred total commercials, but national commercials. I just hit my hundredth a couple of years ago. I did a Mercedes spot, and it was hilarious. It was like nineteen supermodels and one ugly grocer, and that was me. I was the ugly, obviously the ugly grocer. But that was my <laughs> one one hundredth commercial, and that was shot in Seattle, which was really, really neat. But I, so I got going in that, and. Most people think, well, how can you, you're an actor in a commercial, really? Like, the community sees that, like the acting community or the, the people that make moves. So I was getting cast in little bit parts and stuff. And I was actually, you know, I hated my buddy, John Deverell. Got like, the, you know, your buddies with fads, right? He was your bud. He was your yeah. bro, Mitch Fadden. My buddy was John Deverell when I played. We did everything together. And, stuff. and he always gives me that soul-crushing thing. He goes, you know, but... Why didn't you stay acting? Like you were about to be a huge star, and then you went and worked for Tampa. Like, why did you do that? <laughs> I'm like, thanks, dude. Like, thanks a lot. Because I was doing a lot of like guest stars on TV shows and stuff like yeah. that, and was starting just like hockey. Like you talked about the similarities. You start, you start in the minor leagues, right? Most guys, not if you're a star. Most guys start in minors for the minor leagues is commercials. Then you do, then you get speaking roles in commercials. Then you do a little acting, like your appearances in TV shows. You might have a line or two or in a movie. And you just kind of work your way up, right? Until you, unless you're a big star and you hit it, but most guys do that. And they do either stand up or improv. And mine, mine, I'm not a good stand up. I tried it, I suck at it. I did improv, which, if you're that familiar, is like whose line is it anyway? Yeah. I still do yeah. it. I, yeah. So I, I did that for years. I was a part of a group called the LA Connection. Um, and I did shows. I did like six, six to eight shows a week for seven years. And, and, uh, and, in between jobs. And so, yeah, a lot of my hockey buddies, guys from the Bullfrogs and, and afterwards, uh, pro beach hockey was on ESPN. I was involved with that. Um, they would all come and watch the shows on the weekends and, and try and take a shot at me, but they don't realize, you know, in the locker room, we're all sitting on the same bench at the same level. Well, when I'm on stage, I'm just a little bit higher and a little bit louder. So I have, I, it doesn't matter what they say, right. I get, I can get to them. So, but I had a blast doing that. And that was what helped me get, the roles I got. So the, the role in Saw, it was great. And it helped me kind of get into a different category of movies. I'd never done a horror film before. And since that time, I did probably five or six after. Like, oh, we got to get the guy from Saw. You know, like, let's get the Hughes and Saw. Let's get him. In fact, I'm pl doing a movie next month in Seattle uh, called Zomb Zombie, Zombie, some Zombie something. And I, I feel bad for the guy. When it comes out, I'll plug it. But right now it's called Zombie something. And it was like, I didn't have to audition, which is cool. I mean, you know, not that I mind, but because of the role in Saw. It's called Zombie Geddon, by the way. There you I, go. Hey, I have your IMDB page open. That's why I, you know, I'm, I'm, looking, already, I'm looking at it. It's already on there? Pardon me? It's already on, it's already on there? Wow. Yeah, it's under pre-production. Pre so. Oh, cool. cool. That's, pretty, that's pretty cool. But you were also in the Wonderland murders, too. There, like, looks like you were... In that quite a few times and i mean it's, those, it's those are fun cool. those those are fun dude those like the, playing a cop is a blast playing a killer is a blast and i know this sounds creepy and it doesn't it's like you're playing like a, a a rapist drug addict i'm sorry it's it's i'm not gonna say it's cool it's it's interesting yeah. If you take it seriously, yeah, like, you, know, right? like, you have yeah. to be able to f like m emotionally and physically move and and do everything. I guarantee you, I could play a good drug addict. I guarantee it. Oh, for sure. And, you know, and you know, in the in the wild world of Hollywood news, I know, right? Yeah, I know. Is they have consultants for everything. 
Yeah. They act like if you're doing a movie about teacups, they're going to have a teacup ex expert there and stuff like that. If they yeah. have something like that, like there are, and your story, dude, I like, I want to know more. And I know I'm so glad we got to reconnect before this show and, th and this all yeah. happened. But, you know, and, and a lot of that was Alan May and he was on the show. Yeah. He called me right when he was doing it. I texted him today and said, you're never going to get what? He's like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta watch, you know? Um, well, that shout out. Like he's a, he was, you know what? He was so kind to me while he was, while I was there. I think he knew more than anybody something was up. And, you know, obviously I wasn't going to tell anybody, but he, you know, what a stand up guy, man. I, I really, really have a lot of love and respect for Alan May. And yeah, he was on he, my show prior to the, to the name change. But it's cool that you, that you talk to him. And if he does watch or he hears it, shout out to you, Mazer. And thanks again for coming on the show, man. He's the best. Like he, he took me under his wing in junior. And uh, when when he moved up to New West, he called New West and got them to take a look at me. And and then when he went to pro, he's the reason I turned pro. It was Alan May. I wasn't drafted. Uh, you know, he it was it was all him. So when when I when I got the job in in uh, Norfolk, he called me wanting to. He was already coaching and a good coach wanted a coaching job. And I was like, yeah. He goes, what do you mean? Yeah. I go, yeah. Like I'll let's I'll, if I can make it happen, I will. And that was it. And that's how he ended up there. Wow. That's cool. He was a, honestly, he was, he was such a great assistant coach. Now he's doing a lot in the broadcasting side and he's, you know, he's, he's great at that too. I, I'm not sure if he's still going to be doing that in the, in the future, but I, I hope to see him. I mean, I'm more of a Canadian guy up here. He's on NBC, I think. Right. But uh, yeah. there, there he is there. He was, man, he was, he was a tough, he was a tough guy back in the day, man. I watched a lot of his fights and uh, yeah, what a, just such a great guy, man. Honestly, I was so, so thankful to be able to reconnect with him after all those years and actually have like a conversation with him and let him kind of know what was going on. I'm sure he had lots of players and lots of things, but you know, from my standpoint, it was like, you know, yeah, you were right about, you know, something was, you know, he's like, you couldn't even look me in the eyes and different things. And I'm like, yeah, well, I just had lots going on, but it's pretty cool. I didn't, I wouldn't, I, I honestly I didn't guess, sorry to cut you off. I wouldn't have guessed that that's how he ended up there, you know? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, it was a no brainer. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I hung up the phone and I got to tell you, like, you know, when you came in was right when I came in, right in 09 or 08, 09. And then here's this guy coming out of junior who, um, you know, I coached a little bit in the pros, but I never worked in, I mean, in the East Coast League or the West Coast League, right? Never worked for an NHL organization prior to that, right? So here I am coming in. I've got a list of guys in Traverse City and I'm sorry, in, uh, in uh, Victoria, you being one of them. And no, no guys of what to do. Um, no guidance. No, just like figure it out. You got to do all this stuff. So all these moving parts, anyways. And Mazer was so cool. He goes, "Hey, Butts." He goes, uh, "You wondering why I took two days to call you?" And I like after I got the job, right? I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, I, your phone must have been blowing up for two days. I wanted to give up a little time to think about how you're going to hire me." And I, I said, "What?" <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, and he was coaching. Like we would talk about that too. And and I'll tell you something. Like he, he said something just now about when he said he takes the time. Al May is like seventh level sharp. This is going to be like a, my my thing on on Mazer. But he, um, when when certain players in the NHL got hurt, he would talk to me about um, addiction. He would talk to me about concussion. He would talk to me about little things. Like that he can see, reads through things, you know, guys, he doesn't get as much credit. Like I think he was a hell of a coach when, when, when he was in Norfolk there, he, um, he connected with the guys really well. And you could probably yeah. attest that, you know, you know, what you went through, but he had this ability to connect to the guys because he was one of the guys, well, we all were, but he was one of those guys that scrapped his way out of Edmonton to play tier two, to play tier one. He started in the Atlanta coast league, like, you know, and, and had that, had to every year he was traded at what five or six years in a row in the trade deadline like yeah. he he appreciates what he has and i i want to see him if he wants to do it i mean the guy's bound by nothing you know he just he's got his mindset to go for it he keeps himself in great shape but the thing with you like i said he cares like he cares about the guys and yeah. the game he cares about it, you know and that's what makes him special and and i'm, I'm proud to call him a buddy like we, we i love talking to him yeah, he's uh, the two of you guys, the stories, the conversations that you could have if the walls could talk. Holy man, but, <laughs> you know, here's, a quick one. here's a quick one. We slept on the floor the first four days we worked in Norfolk, maybe the first week. We never found a place that we slept in the office, got air mattresses because we just spent all day there, anyways. So we're like, 
to sleep. Nobody knew that. And when they found out, they got mad because they're like, you know, you got to keep this image up, suit and tie every day and doing this. And I'm out of junior. He's been coaching in Texas. We're just like, yeah, screw it. And we just got air mattresses and stay there and showered in the room. And we just, you know, we just lived that way for, for uh, it, was, it was over a week. I know that. So. <laughs> that's a great story. See, I I played. I was there every day. I never, you know, especially during nope. the beginning there. Like, I never would have known, guessed that. But nope. uh, all funny. you have to do is look behind the couch leaves. That was where our air mattress behind my couch in the office. We stuffed <laughs> the air mattresses in there. Yeah, we get there early enough, right? And we'd have breakfast and stuff. We would clean up the oatmeal, and, and then and then we'd shower up and get 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 ready for practice before you guys got to the rink every day. So. That's hilarious. That's so funny. Yeah. See, those are the stories that, you know, I love to hear. It's uh that's, that's the life of, you know, minor pro hockey. I mean, the AHL, let's be honest, man, the AHL, I still to this day, don't think it gets nearly enough credit, uh, you know, especially up here in Canada. Like if there's not, at least on the West coast, I know there was Abbotsford there for a short time and stuff, but if they looks like they may be getting a team again, which will be more connected to the Vancouver Canucks, which I think will blow it up because, you know, home interest and stuff. But you want to talk about good hockey, man. The American Hockey League is no joke. And it's, you know, I was in for a world of hurt. I didn't train, didn't do everything. I'm like, holy shit, like, where the hell am I right now? This is not junior anymore, right? And, um, but yeah, I'm still grateful for the opportunity just to say, you know, I got in a couple games in, in the American League. It was a great experience. Got to play with some great players. And, you know, more than anything, I developed that friendship with Mitch Fadden. And, you know, now he's a, a big part of what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I look at his picture every day and, I got pictures actually somewhere. I should have brought them up of me, him, and Stamkos on the ice together in Victoria and different things. It was, uh, you know, it's it's crazy how how life can change. You know, all the three of us are are there together. We we played on the line together, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, obviously Stammer had you know first overall. He was project. He was gonna be an NHL superstar. There was no doubt about it. Um, but you know, he goes that way. <laughs> Mitch, you know, goes down a path. I go down a path, and and unfortunately, he's no longer here. And you know, we see Stamkos lift the Stanley Cup. I was homeless. It's it's crazy, right? And it just goes to show that it doesn't matter who you are or whatever, anything can really happen. And that's a big thing about what I'm doing. And Mike, I'm just curious as to you. It seems like you kind of had this transition. I mean, you were kind of set up to go in this direction after hockey. Um, I mean, you're still in hockey, but after your playing days, because you were doing the acting and the side hustle, like you said. But when you retired from hockey back in 1996. Um, or yeah, I'm not sure if you played roller hockey after that because I, I don't have it here. But when you were actually done playing hockey, what was that like for you? And and did you have a hard time with that? Like, what what was the overall experience? Or were you just like, hey, I'm going to find going this? It seemed like you were kind of always no. involved. But... Well, I so like I said, I broke my back in a preseason game in Quebec, and and uh, I I, uh, I I woke up with a doctor's thumb up my ass. Right, I couldn't feel my legs, and and they were brought in a priest and they thought I wasn't going to walk again. So I was out for a while. I got bought out of my contract and all I thought about was playing. I knew nothing else, right? Kind of like you, yeah. right? Where I knew nothing else but, but, but play. And so that's what brought me down to Anaheim. And, and I, uh, I played for Barry Melrose in, in Adirondack. Um, the year they won the Calder, I was there for a lot of that year and then got shipped off uh, to Quebec or to Halifax, actually. Anyways, um, Barry said a few, he says, when I get traded, he goes, if I'm ever coaching in the NHL, he goes, he goes, you have a job. And I said, really? He goes, yep. And so anyways, I, I, uh, I wanted to come back from that injury from the back break. And I, I thought roller hockey was going to be a way to do it, you know, get in shape and show and got invited to uh, King's camp that year. And it was all laid out and had a, a contract contingent on passing a physical. And I couldn't get, uh, I couldn't get a series of doctors to pass my physical. So when I left the game, I was, I was bitter. I still wanted to play. I trained hard. I went and played roller hockey that summer and trained, you know, most guys were out boozing. At first I did some of that, but not like I was training, right. I wanted to make that team. They wouldn't even let me on the ice. So I, I didn't want to be around the game and I was, re I wasn't ready to leave, but when that opportunity came up in acting, that incorporated hockey, it was a better, it was an easy transition, you know, like it was, at least I got a little taste of it. And they used to have me take like big actors to games when, when they do hockey movies, like when they were doing um, Mystery Alaska, I won't say the name, but they asked me to take one of the big actors in the movie to a game, explain to them what the hell was going on out there. Right. And yeah. I love it, dude, you would love it. Like uh, there's this one guy, I did a bunch of movies in the early nineties uh, with a guy named Bill Nunn, another buddy of mine who died. 
he was uh, Radio Rahim and, and Do the Right Thing. And a little too old for your generation, but all the Spike Lee movies, he was in all of them. Right? He was in, so in Mo Better Blues. Anyways, I did a couple of films with him. And he goes, man, what is all this hockey about? And I said, oh, I'll take you to a game. And, you know, you're sitting there before before they drop the puck, and you're like, all right, Nanner, watch those two guys there. They're going to go after it. And he goes, what? How do you know that? It's just stuff you know, right? <laughs> and those guys just love it. They think you're a guru. They, they think you walk on water because you know when two guys are going to fight. Well, something we've done a lot of, right? So, but that is fun seeing people that are new to the game. Because, like I said, well, I was there when Gretz got traded there, and LA was hockey crazy. The Ducks came, it was yeah. all fresh and new. It was awesome. Yeah, that must have been an exciting time to be down there. Do you think going down there, though, and, and playing for the Anaheim team, like, did that? help you i mean obviously it did but how much of an impact did it have on you know your career outside of hockey in the in the movie industry like because you made a lot uh, of connections it's crazy it right never, never would have happened it never would have happened had i not gone to play roller hockey in anaheim none of this would have ever happened. i'd always uh, maybe not dreamed of it but thought maybe i'll be a stand-up comedian maybe i'll be an actor i like doing movies you know I, I, it, it, so anyways i went down there and um I went down there with that purpose. I didn't go down there to play roller hockey. I went down there hoping to get into the film business somehow. Yeah. My question you know? too, though is like, you've done a lot of different roles and, you know, sometimes it's a month or two, but I'm, you know, I, I look at your, just your team staff history on elite prospects. I mean, from 2001, you know, all the way to 2011, you were involved in a huge way with teams, you know, obviously being in junior uh, with Helena Bighorns for like ever as the GM, associate coach, president, all of that. And then, you know, and two with, with Norfolk there. But I mean, where do you find the time during the season if you're, you know, coaching or being a GM? Like, did you ever have to take a leave of absence for, and go shoot or? You know, it kind of, it kind of worked out. I mean, yes, I did. And 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 I got to tell you, when I first when I first saw you on the screen, because I haven't seen you with the with the stash, right? Uh, I, I had a stash. I had a stash like that for a movie I did. Uh, it's it's got to be ten years ago now, but it looked almost similar. The stash, right? And and I had to take a leave of absence. And and I, my junior team was playing a showcase in Minneapolis, right? And uh, where I am now. Anyways, I got, I was buddies with a guy named Chad Johnson, another one of my buddies that unfortunately took his own life. He was depression and. And alcoholism, and he's just the, the funniest guy in the world. I miss him. Anyways, I was dying to get to Minneapolis to tell him about the movie I was shooting. So here I am sitting at the Blaine uh, multiplex. There's like eight rinks. There's a few thousand people in the rink, all milling around, junior sc college scouts, the whole thing. And I've got my huge Fu Manchu from the movie <laughs> and long hair and everything. Cause I still have the, this wig in from what I was wearing and I was a rapist and I'll, and, and I, I would uh, abuse hookers and kill them. It was a, a murdering thing. It was a, a murdering movie. It was called Mr. Soul. But anyways, uh, I'm explaining to him in the lobby of this thing. I said, okay. And then, and I'm just talking to him about the movie. I'm saying, and then, okay. So then I grab my knife right, and I slit and I cut her up into pieces and then I put her in a paper uh, in a bag and she wouldn't fit in the bag. So I had to slam the trunk down and I got blood all over my hands and, and I'm telling the story and I just wiped it off my face and stuff. And by the time I finished the story, there's like 40 people like huddled around like this. Like they thought I was telling a real story about how I raped and murdered this lady. And I'm just telling them about the movie, right? Because they see this big, ugly guy with the spoon and shoe, right? Yeah, we laughed about that. But yeah, I've had to take time off. Sorry, I deflect. But I, 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 take, I had to take time off. There was a time in Norfolk. I don't know if you made the trip when we went up to, we were in Springfield and stuff like that. And I actually, we had a couple days off. So I went to New York to do a card signing. For, uh, it was a horror movie convention. I went there for that. And then there was another time where I had to go and do like a, um, some kind of uh, memorabilia signing. And then uh, like I had it when I when I took the job in Tampa that I had the out that if I had a movie that I would I would be, have the option to go do it if I had to. Because you can't in that business. You, you always I always say like I'm not I'm not a good actor. I'm just available. You just have to be available. You know. Like, yeah, I, well, I've been there. Right? Yeah, like I've been married 27 years, 26 years, and uh, we've, we haven't gone on a honeymoon because every time we plan a honeymoon, I book a job, an acting job. 
So when funds are low and we need cash, I'm like, uh, yeah, we better plan a honeymoon because, you know, I'm going to book an acting job, you know? So, <laughs> oh, that's it, so happens, it happened every time. That's every so single funny. time. I, I got a couple of, you know, there's a couple of comments coming in. I'm just going to get, there's actually a whole bunch. I just want to get to, uh, to a couple of them and uh, I'll get to the ones at the top from the beginning of the show. I'm getting a lot of uh, people, you know, just, I appreciate all of you guys, re, you know, congratulating me on 17 months clean and, and all of that. We'll get to that at the end, but I'm very grateful yeah. to all of you guys. Uh, Sally Clark is watching. Yahoo. Yeah. Buzzy. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sally, I, when I played in Greensboro on the East Coast League, her family was my, you know, they have those secret families. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, and they send me clip and stuff like that. I've been friends with them ever since. And she's Sally, beautiful person inside and out. And uh, I love her and I miss her. So that's great. That's hilarious. She's watching the show. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, David Grass says hockey players have lots of personalities. Canadians are funny too. He's wondering is it the Goldbergs you were talking about, that show with yeah. the eight millimeter yeah. camera? Yeah, yeah, there you go. David Grass has got it. He's got it. Um, <laughs> Mike is right. Lots of dicks in the entertainment in industry. Um, she all, Sally also says, Miss Debbie, about your buddy there. Um, Matthew Meanser, he's been on the show. This guy is, you know, I talk about him all the time. He's a friend of mine. He's actually down in South America um, in like the, it, in the middle of nowhere, like this, you can't go any further south than the South Pole, and he's growing the game of hockey down there. You know the locals can't afford, you know, to import sticks and stuff. So he's a carpenter. He actually has taken, found a local tree down there, and he's making, you know, wood hockey sticks for the locals and stuff. It's very cool. Their 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 rink is completely frozen by the temperature outside and everything. It's very very wow. cool. Yeah, he's doing some amazing work down there. So shout out to to Matt. He says, awesome show. Great guest again, Brady. Um, this one is the one that I've been waiting to get to because, you know, this is a, a friend of mine these days and he played against you and he's pretty sure that if you do remember him, he you're going to think he's an asshole. His name is Stuart Smith. He played for the Weyburn Red Wings. And he says, hey, Mike, the 1985 oh, SHL final against Weyburn, where does that game, that seven game series rank in an epic battles for you? By the way, sorry for being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, Stu. Yeah, it's been a lot. I tell a story about uh, we played when I, the one year I played at U of M, he was playing at U of R, and we had a little dust up uh, right near the end of the game and, and tried to meet underneath the stands and stuff like that. But as you know, Smitty, we, none of us ever take that personally and stuff. But that, that series was was easily top five i might say top three might even be top two and won a calder won won a ihl title and won you know but that series was an absolute freaking war you know our coach is jerry james legend in the game uh dwight mcmillan we showed up for game seven in wayburn and um they had a life-size mannequin in our locker room with the head cut off and blood like fake blood all over the locker room Jerry James die and they had all this stuff. No glass on the on the um, on the wall and the, the sideboards. You know they didn't have any glass. So when you get hit over the boards, you go over and they. And when we we ended up winning that game, but uh, they cut the wires to our bus and all that. Um, that was as far as rivalry goes. Um, that's one of the best rivalries in the game of hockey. And and that was at a tight. Weyburn had won the Centennial Cup the year before. We came in. The next year, I ended up winning the league from them. And it was just a heyday of the Saskatchewan League. And, and it was just a bitter, bitter rival. Like, people would drive 45 minutes to go to those games and stuff like that. It was it was, uh, it was, was nuts. And Smitty was a prick. He was tough. He was, he could play. He was good. And he was he would just, yeah, like, you know, I, I, it, he'd give me nightmares. Like, he was, he was a good player. And, and I remember that. Like, we used to jaw at each other all the time. So, Smitty, man, no hard feelings, buddy. He, uh, yeah, I know he's become, you know, he's actually in Abbotsford, uh, British, he's out in Abbotsford, BC, and he's a, he's a, he's a fire, he's a firefighter. He's, you know, looking like, like he may get a promotion, you know, I'm hoping that he does, but he's been there for, for a long time. And I actually met him, you know, through my dad, who, uh, you know, is a longtime firefighter who's now ret uh, retired, but, um, you know, they, he, you know, connected me with Stu and Stu has become one of, you know, my greatest friends these days, you know, I'm more probably like a son to him, but, um, you know, he's been, you know, he's been there for me, uh, more than 
uh, a lot of people. And that's saying something because there's been so many people. I, I even hate to say that, but there's been a lot of people there for me, you know, especially, you know, where I'm at, S- Susan Cook's house. I actually live in Harry Sinden's niece's house. Um, you know, so, you know, aside from Susan, um, you know, and, and, you know, my family members and stuff, Stuart's like right at the top. And he, he messaged me today, he text. He's like, make sure, you know, tell him that, that, you know, I've changed and, uh, you know, I'm not an asshole anymore. And, you know, her kids, he says, love you, Mike, so many stories. And, um, he actually sent, you know, it's cool as he sent me, um, I'm, I'm trying, I thought I had them loaded up. I'm trying to, uh, to get them here, but he sent me a couple, uh, pretty cool pictures today of, you know, your guy, you know, times back in the day. And I can see, you know, if, let me get that. Oh, yeah. You can see, you know, from, from back in the day and it's, uh, you know, you can I wasn't see, scratched. I wasn't scratched there. All right. <laughs> you can see Al, May there, right? Al, May, yeah. Al May's on there. And, you know, so he dug, he dug those out and, you know, there's one more. So, but he was telling me like, he's like, that guy probably, you know, thinks I'm the biggest asshole. Um, no, not at all. You know, so. I, I mean, Lee, you know this too. And, and I always, I always found this, um, it just in my travels in hockey and, and over the years is that the guys that did what we did, the guys that let's just say didn't score goals and have to do some of the heavy lifting. I think as the years go on, um, we get less tough, you yeah. know, when we tell yeah. the stories, like yeah. every story I tell, I don't know if I won or lost. I don't remember. I usually probably got my head kicked in. Right. <laughs> it's the guys that weren't tough that tell the stories now. And you swear they're like undefeated heavyweight champions all the time. And, and I never took any of it personally. Like, it, it, I, no one ever really got personal with me and all this, the, the dust ups. I mean, I, I remember Stewie and I used to run our mouths at each other all the time. And yeah, I didn't like him, but didn't know him. But he did the same thing I did. And I, I te- when I coach my kids, I did say the same thing, guys. It's like, you're, you're better off respecting, respect the fact they love to do what you love to do. Just want it more than they do, right? Don't hate them for it. Respect them because if you hate them, you're not gonna. It's not gonna fuel you. Hate only can fuel you so far, right? Yeah. You got to get guys to be motivated, stuff. And you know, I'm sure when you talk about your your testimony or your what you've gone through through your struggles, that hate is a big part of that, right? And it got you yeah. so far, but you can't yeah. get there on hate alone. You just can't, right? Wow. And that, and with that's the, so true. Well, I never really thought of that's. Hold on. <laughs> That I uh, yeah I, I I absolutely love that man. That's so true. But keep going. I'm I'm listening. But wow, wow. No, yeah. and, and, and you know the guy the guy and I I'm going to go back to this for a second because the guy that gave that I had these deep conversations with about the just the inner workings of the human mind. The game was Tommy Kerr's. Like he, you know, he's he's worked in every position in hockey. Never mind the hockey. This guy could take a paragraph and turn it into a sentence, and the sentence made more sense to you than the paragraph. Do you know what I mean? He just could encapsulate things in the way he would say things. Like he always used to say, uh, he always used to say, uh, hey, boss, don't, don't get out of your skis on this one. You know, I know it's an old saying, but it was like, it says everything. Like, don't overextend yourself or don't do that. But he would talk about the little nuances of character and the, and the, the game itself. Like, I, I saw an interview with him about a month ago, and uh, – and he said he was going on this thing with hockey news. And uh, it, it was awesome the way he talked about the love for the game. Like um, like yourself, okay? Now, did I know you well, Norfolk? No, I didn't. I was new and green to it too. And I heard what happened, but I wasn't really, you know, I was there, but not really in, didn't draft you, but was a part of that that regime when you were in, you know, with us. And, um, but I feel a kinship to you there, Kirby. I feel a kinship to you and, and, and having gone what you've gone through, like, dude, like we're connected in some way, not, you know, like we're just connected. And, and I'm sure that when you went through your struggles, a lot of people turn their back on you, but the right people did yeah. the right, yeah. the right people would be say like, Hey, what can I do to help? And and even if it's nothing, you know, what can I do? Like I, I've had some friends that, well, like, you know, Tommy went through cancer and, and, um, I, uh, I used to take it upon myself like every couple of days just to call him and make him laugh or text him. Yeah. I had another buddy who went, Roy Henderson, who you probably know from Global. Yeah. You know, Roy had Roy had cancer years ago and he called me and he says, I, I haven't told my wife yet. He goes, you're the first guy I'm calling. And I said, well, why, why are you telling me? He goes, because I just want you to call him every day and make me laugh. 
you know, and that's a good, that was his cure. And I would call him every time because when I went through my concussion, I went into a deep, dark spiral after, um, like when I got in a car crash when I was in Tampa and that's what took me off the road and eventually led to me leaving. Right. And, and I just didn't want to live anymore. And it was for a different reason. I had my head all messed up and stuff like that. And I remember coming out of the fog and, and having someone there to make me laugh was that, you know, and that was curves curves was there to just kind of hey, cheer up, you know, but uh, you got to have guys like that around. And I'm sure, like I said, you've gone through what you've gone through. I can't imagine what you've gone through. Only you have, have had that journey. Guys have had similar journeys, but not your journey. But you've got it. You, you, I'm sure you can categorize every guy along the way. And this guy was there for me. And this guy would be there for me if I really needed him. But you know, maybe not if, you know, for every day. But, but this guy was a rock. This guy turned his back on me. And there was no reason. I didn't ask him for anything. All of these things, you always know where people are at when things are down for you, right? Now, yeah. That was the same for me. You know? That was that was a hard thing. I you know I think looking back on it, I mean I'll be honest, my addiction was so bad that you know nobody, I didn't want anybody's help unless that was you know I wanted money from them so you know I could just give drugs. That's the reality of what I was. I didn't ask a whole lot of people. I took advantage of my dad a lot, and there's you know a few people out in my hometown, of course. But you know it's interesting because all the people that you know I owe, let's say I I owe money to. I mean in the life, life of drugs, I got thousands of dollars owed to me i probably owe a thousand of dollars still but a lot of the people you know that i actually burned you know money or whatever they're the ones that have come forward and been like hey you know just glad you're doing well and whatever and then there's the ones that you know i didn't really do anything to and they're just like you know gone like that you know i've tried to reach whatever people that i grew up with man that i thought were like my brothers and it's like wow were these people actually my really my friends and you know the only answer i can give is a lot of them i had a lot of great friends i grew up played hockey that went on to play pro hockey as well they've all you know come we're all you know friends again and stuff uh, made amends to the ones that i need to make amends to in that but there's people that i grew up to that you know i played minor hockey with and stuff and it seems like as soon as i didn't have you know free sticks to give them or you know parties to take them to or yeah, whatever no like they're you know they're all gone and it took me a long time to kind of get over that and realize that you know but now you know i'm just grateful to be in the position i'm in because there's you know so many people that have supported me and that are there for me and those are the like friendships and i think i took advantage of them for the like the majority of my life is you know actually having people that you can count on and and then you can they can count on you there's something very special about that and it took me a lot longer than i care to admit to realize that and you know so anybody that's watching you know i have a lot, few friends watching that you know, I'm just grateful for you guys. Um, there's a couple more comments I want to get to. Um, David Carlson, great interview. He's been like, he, David Carlson's been watching since day one when I started just spamming Facebook. I had no idea how to start a podcast. I'm like, here, check this out. It was terrible. David, thank you. Um, he's always watching. Um uh david grass says i'm living through that right now well said mike um sally says your journeys made you even stronger thank you sally there's a couple more that i want to get to here brody kerbison down Barry says never lets us down another great guest um stanley clark wrote i can see hey you're the greatest bass player ever love your band hope i could join it i saw that one is that what it's <laughs> <laughs> no, i just i play music and so i always said that's just throwing that in there yeah uh, Alex Van Halen said, "Hey, you should learn guitar. I want you in the band." <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. Sorry Steve it. says, "Butts, you are the man. Great job, boys." Um, Sean For Horsewell, so funny, a true badass. Um, lots of good comments coming in. So appreciate you guys all for the comments and watching. You know, live sometimes. You know, we we the majority of people are going to listen to this by audio, but I felt like doing these shows live, there's just more authenticity to it. You know, I don't go back and I don't edit them. I don't do, you know, I used to spend hours, man, editing these podcasts that were pre-recorded. And it's like, wow, I'm like, why? Let's just let yeah. this roll really. And it is what it is. And we can never, I used to have all these notes and different things and I'd be done the podcast. I'm like, I'm like, why did I even do this? I had Doug Gilmore on my show. He's been on a couple of times, but the first time he was on, man, I can't tell you. I think I read his book twice. I had like 10 pages of notes. Like, and and by the end of the interview, I'm like, well, that was useless because I didn't even look at it, right? You can never anticipate what it's gonna be. Um, my yeah. friend, my friends at B Sharp Ottawa always says, ha, amazing story, Stuart. 
Okay, that's pretty funny. I was, I was a little, I was like, I wonder how he's, I wonder if he's, I, I was pretty sure you were going to remember Stuart, but I wasn't sure how, you know, what, what it was going to lead up to. Cause I didn't know how bad it was. He didn't tell me the story, but I'm glad that you, you know, you shared and stuff and it's, it's pretty awesome. So, oh, what, it's just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, what's, you know, what's up with you these days? I know you've been involved in the Seattle hockey community. Is that where you're based out of now? Yeah, so I live in uh, almost at Everett, that far north. I live in a okay. town called Bo- Bo- well, you know. Is that by Bellevue or wherever? Uh, north of Bellevue, I live in Bottle. And, okay. Uh, yeah, that's where my peeps are. You know, I, I, I spend most of my days at the rink. I uh, you saw I got Zombie Geddon coming up. I got another movie. Um, the working title is called Greenport, but uh, Bruce Willis is in it, and I'm uh, I got I'm playing a good role in that, and that's filming uh, this fall, late fall. And then uh, I'm going to be, uh, I just found out I'm going to be cast in the uh, Squaw Valley movie. They're doing a movie about the 1960 Olympic nice. team. And uh, they needed they needed a, a left winger who could dangle and snipe. So they uh, got somebody else. And then they needed an old guy in the stand to clean up. And they got me. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so that, that is picked up. I'm always, I'm always talking to new kids about uh, the mentoring business that I do. I keep that going on. I got a kid, I got two kids. I got one kid going into college. She's playing hockey at UMass Boston in the fall. So that's wow. going to be challenging for her. My other one plays uh division one beach volleyball at Houston Baptist. She's doing great. Proud of my kids. And, okay. um, so I try to get to see them as much as I can, and and uh, got a got a a, um, a jewelry business that I, I started uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, yeah, I'm doing that. I've got my own Etsy store. Uh, I sell, I, I buy estate jewelry and gold and stuff like that, and and uh, uh, doing that, and uh, um, just again trying to trying to get my next cup of coffee. Everybody knows leaves. When they see me like at Global or at a hockey camp or something like that, my currency is coffee. They go, how do you do it? How do you stay up so long? How do you what? Uh, I go, just hand, whenever you see me without a coffee in my hand, hand me a coffee, you know, <laughs> and, and that that's what just keeps me going. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm loving, I like, you got to write a book, dude. I love your story and I've only scraped the surface of it. There's some stuff that hits home with me and it just, it's, it's, don't get, don't, don't ever think that people aren't listening or caring because they are. And you may not see it all the time and you may not hear it all the time, but there's a huge community behind this and behind you. And I've talked to a lot of guys in the game and, um, you know, like um, just just keep doing what you're doing and plug away. And and, and if you want, I'll love to get you some people on the show because uh, it's a blast and, and uh, it's 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 light. It's not phony. You're a real dude. I loved you when you played. I didn't know you well, but love the you had some passion and now. Major and I talked about it. And he said, you know, that like, he could see some early struggles and stuff. And, and like, again, yeah, he's one of those guys. Like, we had a player, and I, I can't say who it is, but we had a player in Tampa who had since moved on to another team. And he had a concussion. And the first thing Mazer called me, he goes, hey, do you still talk to him? I said, I actually do. I, I connected really well to him. He goes, see, find out if he's on cocaine. And he just had this seventh degree black belt of connecting it all to cocaine, right? And he was right. Yeah. Yeah. He was right. You know, it was like, wow. Like he knew right away what it was all about, you know? Yeah. And that's this kind of, that's really the kind of stuff that's invaluable in a, in a community like that, right. Is being able to connect with, with individuals, but not just that, but being able to see the things that they're not going to come and tell everybody else about. So anyways, uh, you know what, man, I appreciate your time. You're a welcome guest anytime on this show. And if you know anybody that wants to come on, you know, just, you know, I would be honored to, if you want to pass on the word, I appreciate it so much. And um, how's, uh, how's tomorrow night work for you? Yeah, anytime, <laughs> anytime, man. I'll make it. Yeah. I'm just I'll kidding, make but no, no, I had a blast. Love to come back, and and we'll be. I'm, this, hopefully, this is a start of something good, man. Keep talking, and I'd love to hear more about what you're doing. And write that stuff down. Get a book going. And if yeah. you need help with that, I'd love to help. Like it's, I want to hear your stories. I really do. My it honor- matters. Honestly, man, my story is it's it's out there, right? Like people know about it, but people don't really know how insane it was. And I don't brag about that. Like it was bad, man. Like I could write a book on one day of being homeless on Hastings in Vancouver, like one day. And I was down there for almost a year, man. The the drug collections, the robberies, the 
stabbing, like ev- just that. Never mind the pro hockey career tied in with that. So, you know, it's going to happen. And, you know, I appreciate the, you know, offering the support. And I, I honestly, I think it's a story that needs to be told just to make people realize just one more story. I'm not the only one that's gone through something like this, but just to impact people and maybe kids growing up, teenagers, you know, can hear it. And, and maybe they'll make that just one person say, no, I'm not going to do that or somebody who has been abused to come out and ask for help before letting it get to the point that i let it get to so thank you man thank you for your time safe travels keep doing all that amazing work with those kids being a mentor man that's to me is the most important thing that you're doing making a difference in those uh boys and girls lives i I think it's primarily boys but all the best to you and your your family your kids good luck to them uh, especially the daughter going to play hockey in her first year Thanks, Matt. Can't wait to get back. I want to see your picture on the wall at Moonshine Barbecue in Linwood. I got to call you, get, get a signed photo for you for the wall. It's a hockey hockey bar and a hockey barbecue joint. And when you see the guys on the wall, you know why you have to be up in that wall. Appreciate All it. Right. All right, man. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Thanks, Butsy. You're the man. I appreciate it. All right, Leaves. See you, buddy. <laughs> see you, bro. <laughs> you doing my dance? You're doing my dance yeah. now. Is that right. your dance? That's what I do yeah, this I gotta, show. Tonight is I the first know. time I didn't do it. The first time. Because it was that good. Way. That's hilarious. Okay, man. Have a good night. Thanks. All right, all right, brother. Take care. Awesome. That was that was way too much fun. Thank you to Mike Butters. Super kind to him to hop on. Last minute. I had another cancellation, which has never happened. It Honestly, it never happened for so long. And then all of a sudden in the past couple of weeks, it's, I guess, summertime and different things. So, Butsy, thank you, man. I appreciate you hopping on here. The show must go on. If you weren't coming on, it would have been me blabbing for an hour, probably 10 minutes. That I wouldn't have done an hour. But my dad always tells me, you know, the show must go on, you know, keep people engaged. I think more than anything, my dad just gets nervous that if I take a, the, my foot off the gas, he's like, oh, shit, is he going to go back down that road of addiction and everything? <laughs> He's still, he's coming around. My dad's coming around. I'm sure he's listening or watching this at some point. He's coming around. Our relationship is getting better. He's trusting me more and more, but I'm sure it's going to take years and years, possibly never to really fully get his trust back. And I deserve all of that, but I'll keep trying. So anyways, uh, we're going to get to one quick sponsor from our friends at Pride Tape. I'll come back and we'll wrap this up. Hockey to Hell and Back is brought to you by Pride Tape. Pride Tape is a badge of support from teammates, coaches, parents, and pros to young LGBTQ players. It shows every player that they belong playing the sport they love and that we're all on the same team. Show your support for teammates, coaches, and fans in the LGBTQ community by wrapping your stick with Pride Tape. Every roll of tape will make an impact in sports and beyond. Inclusion starts with leadership. Check out some of the ideas of how you can get involved at youcanplayproject.org. Check out Pride Tape at pridetape.com. For more information, you can send an email to aubrey at pridetape.com. That's A-U-B-R-E-E, aubrey at pridetape.com. You can find Pride Tape on facebook.com slash pride tape, on Twitter at pride tape, and at pride tape on Instagram. Pride Tape thanks all of you for being champions for change. Thank you to our friends over there, Pride Tape. You guys already know, I always have Pride Tape on my stick. Little Link, as I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen on my social media, he's uh, always taping my sticks up with this stuff. and uh, Super cute on the ladder yesterday and the hurdles. I don't know if anyone saw those videos, but man, he's uh, he's lots of fun. Um, Also, next spring, when I leave for the Rollerblade in the month of June, it looks like Pride Tape's going to be doing a special edition puck support Pride Tape for us to give away during the month of June. So that's really cool. Shout out to my friends at Pride Tape and Curtis Gabriel, who's coming on the show back again in a couple of weeks. I also got Scott Oak coming up. Uh, Wednesday night, Brenly Shapiro. She is the current team psychologist for the Arizona Coyotes, and she's done a ton of work building something brand new in in the local rinks of Ontario, while in Toronto, the one years and years ago, she took a chance, and she's going to tell us about her story and how she came up through hockey, through her boy's love of hockey and seeing a need um, for 
an outlet for mental health uh, at a young age. So I'm super excited to have Brenly Shapiro on the show. And yeah, like I said, Scott Oak, we got Brad May coming up, just trying to make connect all the dots here. Uh, also, Ryan Johansson, I'm hoping next week sometime, we're going to slot him in whenever he wants to come on. We're going to give away some true stuff. Unfortunately, I had some bad news from the courier service uh, regarding my sticks and stuff, and I'm hoping that they show up. Tomorrow would be the dream, but I'm not sure. But I'm um, heading this 400 source for sports in Barrie Tuesday or Wednesday. My ice skates arrived. The rollerblades are not there yet. My true skates, ice skates and rollerblades. Can't wait to get those. Go see Sean Venedem, former guest of the show. Uh, my new friend, go support him at Barry. If you're in Barry, Ontario at all, go support the 400 source for sports. That's pretty much it. I want to give a special shout out to all my family back home. If I try not to cry when I say it, I always start to tear up when I say that it's been way too long. Uh, my parents, but especially my kids, Brooklyn and Brody. Uh, I'm pretty sure Brody listens to these, uh, maybe not regularly, but sometimes. So I always want to make sure that Brooklyn and Brody know that I'm thinking about them, that I love them. It's been over five years since I've seen them and it breaks my heart every single day. Just literally drop to my knees and pray at least once a day, more times really. And just hope that that relationship can be fixed in whatever capacity and whatever time frame is right for them i love you guys i miss you it's really the only regret that i have in my entire life is surrounding my kids i have a lot of great stuff going on but that doesn't mean that all the relationships get mended and that's something that took me a long time to learn through addiction some people may never come back and i can accept that as long as it's not my kids anyways guys thank you so so much if you want to check out Puck Support, PuckSupport.com, get some merchandise, some hats, some shirts. That's my look right there. All of everything we're, we do has an in memory of one of the individuals we've lost. We think about them every single day here at Puck Support. They will never, ever, ever be forgotten. Tonight we remember Chad Miller. This ep episode is dedicated to the memory of Chad Miller. Tragically passed away of an overdose during the hockey season while playing for Robert Morris University after he was prescribed Vicodin, turned to street drugs because his prescription was taken away. This was a kid that never had any history of addiction. This is one of the saddest stories. An, an active hockey player during the season passing away from a heroin overdose and you know i've had his mom on my show last year when it was called hockey to heroin the road to recovery she's become a supporter of puck sport as well out there in portage la prairie shout out to aaron miller and i know michelle minor is watching right now quite possibly with her husband tom i love you guys i so appreciate you guys coming up this week and i guess last week and seeing me i'll never forget it and i look forward to coming down and and seeing where you guys live and being a part of your family in whatever way that I can be. Tom, I got your picture of you guys fishing out there on the river. I'm like jonesing to get out on that boat. Anyone that knows me knows that I love boats. Thank you for coming up. We'll never forget Daniel. Never, ever, ever. We're back Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern with Brenly Shapiro, team psychologist from the Arizona Coyotes of the NHL. Super pumped on that. I'm gonna leave that promo code open for puck support for all you listeners. We're not advertising it anymore, but we'll leave it open at least for the next week. Be kind, stay grateful, and remember, have a great day if you so choose.
Pocket of Hell and Back is brought to you by Performance Wellness. The collaboration between First Star Therapy and MindFrame brings a flexible, holistic program to athletes. The goal is to empower and enhance every athlete's well-being on and off the field of play through focus on intentful movement and mindful practices. You can contact them at consult at firststartherapy.com and team at mindframe.info. Plus, you can check them out on the web at firststartherapy.com and follow First Star on Instagram at firststar.therapy and at mindframe on Twitter plus mindframe fit on Instagram. I want the real stuff, everybody listen up Cause I'll only say it once, I'm gonna show you all the path If you want it bad, I'm gonna show you every side Yeah, how you can get it back, yeah, cause I ain't never done I'll be number one, working hella hard until I get just what I want Yeah, rise just like the sun, yeah, fatal like a gun Shooter's gonna shoot and I'm gonna shoot him till I fall I'm yeah. always do it alone, so I gotta get through it And the only thing I know is to love what I'm doing Never give up, never slow till I finally prove it. Never listen to the nose, I just wanna keep moving. Yeah, I put out all the art, it's my only medicine. Yeah, everything I do, I'm just being genuine. Yeah, I'm sick of being screwed, feel my own adrenaline. Yeah, I do just what I do, and I hope you let me in, let me in, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, 